Well, I've always, I so appreciate Evan and the worship team. I, I've always said, you know, my church back home, I, that I know that Christmas songs are sometimes the hardest uh, season for worship leaders, you know, as they have a, a, a normal rhythm of songs that they do, and then we ask them to adjust and lead us in these songs. And, and uh, I, I just so appreciate it. Look forward to that. I love the twist we've done on some of the songs. And I look forward to Christmas Eve and certainly some, some more songs. Next Sunday, we will celebrate with the last song of Christmas. So we will do one final song next Sunday, the Sunday after Easter, and our children's ministry is gonna lead us in that song. So hopefully you are able to be here. It should be a, a, a great time. Well, as we dive into this uh, final uh, week of Advent, uh, the week of love, talking about love, I would just say this, you know, Dorothy left us wondering in The Wizard of Oz whether or not she actually had traveled to Oz or whether it was just all a dream. Uh, Morpheus in The Matrix, uh, certainly, you know, when, when, when Neo was offered the blue pill or the red pill, to, given the, the, the option of whether he wanted to stay in a false reality or, or find out what real reality was, we were all kind of led into that. Uh, then there was Dom Cobb, who was played by Leonardo DiCaprio more recently in the movie Inception. You know, a, a thief who could infiltrate people's dreams and, and leave a memory or, or steal an idea, and we never knew what was reality and what was a dream. Movies like this, every once in a while, there's a story that comes along that really challenges our sense of reality. And we kind of love those alternate reality type movies because it causes us to think on, on really a different level. Well, I just say this morning that 2,000 years before these fictional stories were ever penned, a very real story takes place in Luke chapter two that certainly provides the same affront to reality because it changed everything that we knew about what it really means to love, about what love can do for us and what love can do for this world. The story is Luke chapter two, verse one through seven is the start of it. And I would like to read that uh, together this morning. I think it'll be up here in front of us. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. And obviously that is the thrust of our Christmas story. That is what we've been singing about. That is what we are celebrating. But on the one hand, there is this Caesar Augustus, the Roman emperor, the son of the, the divine Julius Caesar who appears to have complete power over the known world. You know, this last year, we were all asked to do the census. I don't know, I'm assuming everybody here took the census. And it, you know, it was, uh, many of us complained that it was highly inconvenient because we had to spend five minutes online answering some questions and, and thinking through a couple things. Remember, this was an era where somebody who had so much authority just because he decided he wanted to know, suddenly this entire population, because he wanted a head count, suddenly millions of people were instantly displaced and had to travel elsewhere in order for this census to be taken. So I think we have it much better. Anyway, um, yet we declare today that as powerful as we may think ourselves, or as powerful as the modern Caesars of this world may seem, whether he or she sits in the White House, whether they sit in the UN, whether they have the word manager on their office, it's never been the human powers that really changed the world. It has always been God's love and it always will be God's love that truly changes the world. And that's what this Christmas story is all about. That's what these weeks of Advent have been leading up to to get us to this understanding of not just this, this term that we throw about love, but the love that changed the world. And that's why we really do say this morning that above all else, the Christmas story is a story of love. I was gonna say the Christmas story is a love story and I figure I would lose half of us just like that at that moment. So I'm not gonna say it's a love story. It is a story of love, okay? Of real 
change-making, world-changing kind of a love. But it's not only just a story of love, it is, like I said, it, it is a scandalous, crazy type love that had never been seen before. It's what Paul is trying to get us to understand, to get his readers to understand when he writes his letter to the Romans 60 years later. Romans chapter 5, 6 through 8 says, When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and he died for us sinners. So remember, we've talked about this, this quiet era of 400 years that had gone on where no one had really heard from the Lord and there wasn't any prophetic words that are being put out there and, and there was this sense of will a Messiah ever come? Has God forgotten us? That is so important to remember that when we read those words of Paul. Christ came at just the right time and he died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed us his great love for us by sending Christ to die while we were still sinners. That's why it is crazy love. That's why it's scandalous love. It is, it is a love that was unasked for. It was a love that, was, that, that for many of us was, would have been shunned if we were offered it. No interest whatsoever, but loved us enough to, to to do this incredible, miraculous act even while we were yet sinners. Continuing in Luke 2 is, is the narration of the shepherds uh, that were informed of this miracle. So we just read verse 1 through 7. Uh, verses 8 through 20 really covers the rest of that story that we've looked at before in this Advent season where the shepherds were then informed about this event that was going to happen. And, and as a reminder, I uh, just want to remind us quickly about a few things that this incredible act teaches us. First of all, it teaches us that God's love will always challenge us. Verse 8 and 9 in that story with the shepherds. That night there were shepherds staying in the field nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them, and they were terrified. And I love that no matter what translation you look at, it doesn't matter the different wording. I mean, they were incredibly terrified. They were terribly scared. They were all the different words that lead to, they weren't just troubled or vexed. They were literally out of their mind frightened because of this event, which you can understand. In the complete dark night, suddenly all of this light, all of these voices being faced with the presence of, of angelic beings, of course they were terrified. Any time that we're faced with the presence and the challenge of God, you know, it is a scary thing. That, that presence of God and the challenge of God is often a manifestation of God's love. And when God is moving in love, it can be a frightening thing because it's just huge. It's bigger than life. I remember when I was a kid, I don't know, we were like, I was maybe eight. My dad had paid all of that money. I don't know how much it was back then to have Santa come on the fire truck to our house like literally, like that he pulled up in front of our house and they were laying on the horns and the sirens were going and my dad was so proud. My brother and I wanted nothing to do with that. It was the most frightening thing I had ever seen. Like, like and, and we were boom in the back of the house. My dad's trying to drag us outside and we're crying and terrified. But you know, sometimes when we're faced with a great thing, it is a scary thing. And faced with the hugeness of God and God's love and God's actions, when we are challenged to make adjustments because of that can be a very uh, frightening thing. But, but God's love often will challenge us. More than that, God's love will motivate us to learn more. So if we're challenged by the face of God's love, the next thing is that we're often, because of God's love, motivated to want to know more, to want to go into it deeper. Verse 15 and 16, it says, When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in a manger. I love that line, let's go see this thing which the Lord has told us about. How many times do we make that statement? How many times does God reveal something through scripture or through a message or through a conversation with a friend or through worship that, that really starts to stir something in our heart? Do we make that statement, I better go see this thing which the Lord is telling me about. I better go find out more about this. A few years back in our church back home, 
uh, a young lady showed up one morning, and, and even though we build ourselves as a come-as-you-are church, where we really did everything we could to make sure that everyone knew, no matter what background you're coming from, you are welcome to walk in through these doors, it was very obvious that this, this woman uh, was living a lifestyle that was very different than a biblical lifestyle, just from her presence when she walked in. And certainly as she opened her mouth, that was confirmed, and, and there were some things, that, some really context clues that picked up on very quickly and, and realized, wow. And I, as, as the, the end of that service, that first day she showed up, I remember getting to have a conversation with her and asking her and just getting to know a bit about her, what, you know, what brings you here this morning? Like, what, what was it that brought you to, to come here? And she shared about this, this teen that had come up through our church that was now in college, that was on her campus. And she says, I've watched this girl, Elizabeth. I've watched her on campus. I've watched the way that she interacts with people. I've watched the way she deals with, with people that maybe attack her. I've watched the way she deals with conflict. And I don't know exactly what's going on in her life, but whatever belief system that girl's got going on, I need that. And it was just this great statement of like, I don't know a bunch of theological terms. All I know is whatever that person's got going on, I need to know more about that. That's exactly the same concept as what the shepherds did. Like, like let's go see this thing. And when we are confronted by, by people who are living in God's love, when we are confronted by, by real acts of love that are from the Lord, we are spurred on to well, let's discover some more. Let, I need to know what this is all about. That's part of my story. First time I ever walked into a, a youth group in high school and had no concept of what it would be like and saw something going on there, saw uh, what I didn't recognize at the time was love, but later learned that's exactly what it was. It was from God. I, I didn't understand it, but I knew I had to know more. And that's exactly what the love of God does. It compels us. It, it, it just drives us, motivates us to go deeper and learn more. The third thing is that, and we talked a bit about this already through this series, is that God's love compels us to tell others. Verse 17, it says, After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. So they, they have this incredible moment out in the field, they're spurred on to say, let's go discover this. They go, they, they see, they find the baby. They see it as exactly as the angels had told them. They're overwhelmed and, and, and moved by this precious moment. But they don't just walk away from that. Now, their response is, you know, to just have to tell everybody about what they had been told. And that's what the love of God will do. It spurs us, compels us to tell others. And again, uh, you know, that, that young lady, Dawn, that I talked about that walked into our church that day, she became like the biggest evangelist for our church. Even though she was still getting some things figured out, wasn't ready to let go of some of the things she had going on in her life, man, she was dragging people in every single week. She was just telling people, you've got to come here. You've got to come see about this. She was just so moved because she had encountered the love of God to tell others about it. And uh, that's what tends to happen when we truly have an encounter with the love of God. And so it compels us to tell others. And then this last part, which really can't be overstated, is that God's love will always change us. Certainly if we press into the challenge, certainly if we understand it and accept it, God's love will change us. Verse 18 through 20, it says, All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen. It was just as the angels had told them. I love that, first of all, all who had heard this were astonished. There was something about, even though these were shepherds who were to be distrusted, even though they didn't necessarily know, maybe they did, I, I don't know the, the context of that, but they were hearing the story and they were moved, but something was changing and even just hearing the story. But the shepherds, when we encounter the shepherds, they're not necessarily, maybe they were, but it doesn't tell us in the story, they were just out in the fields doing their job. Now as they go back from this encounter, they go back and they're still going back into their lives and doing their job. But now as they go back doing their jobs, they are glorifying and praising God, meaning they were changed. They were moved now. There was something new in them that was compelling them to glorify and praise the Lord. 
And that's what happens when we encounter the love of God. And this is really the key. If we truly embrace the Christmas story, we will be changed forever. And listen, I love, I love Christmas in all of its colors and brightness and gifts and, and, and the fun stuff that, that we celebrate. I love all of that. But obviously, just those things in themselves are not what it will change us forever. It's the story, it's the real story, it's the manger scene. It's the fact that, that these things that we have talked about, that, that God chose a, a normal couple to do this miraculous thing in and, and, and chose to come and, and take on human flesh and, and be born not in royalty, but in uh, very humble surroundings and, and available to everyone. These are the things that if we really uh, allow ourselves to be challenged by that story, we absolutely cannot help but come out of Christmas changed. But it is about embracing the challenge that the Christmas story gives us. And so to cheat on you a little bit and cram two sermons into one, I want to talk a bit about that, about that challenge. Because there are three challenges in order to really truly be changed that we have to embrace. And the first is the Christmas challenge is to recognize God's love. With all of these things that surround Christmas, one of the challenges we have is to not forget God's love. One of the challenges the outside looking in world has is to recognize God's love. This is talked about hugely in the book of 1 John chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. It says, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. To really truly recognize that love aspect of God in Christmas is a huge important part of this. As, again, as great as the Christmas season is, it's, it's easy to miss the true Christmas story of love amidst all of the presents and the lights and the trees and the decorations and the busyness and the stuff that I love. But we can't forget that aspect. We as believers cannot forget that, to be focused on that, because that's what the looking on world needs to see. This verse reminds us that it's, done, it, it's, it's not just about us being good enough to love God, but the fact that the great gift of Christmas is that he loved us first before we knew that was even necessary. So we have to recognize God's love. But more than just recognizing God's love, the Christmas challenge is then to accept God's love. And many of our stories really probably center on a long time of maybe seeing it in others, maybe hearing about it sitting in churches, but maybe taking quite some time to really accept that love for ourselves. But that's what makes this Christmas story so significant. It's not just significant to watch from a distance. It becomes significant when we accept it and accept the love for ourselves. We read Romans 5, 6 or 8. That's what that is talking about. The, the while we were still sinners, he did this for us. John 3, 16 and 17, a very familiar passage, uh, even for those that have only been around church a little bit. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. You know, this practice of giving and receiving gifts each year is really the great illustration of this. It is the practice of not just recognizing that there is a love of God, but choosing to receive it. Someone can take a wrapped gift from under a tree and they can place it in front of me as a gift, but it is not the, the the purpose of that has not been fulfilled until I choose to take that gift and actually unwrap it, to receive it myself. That is what it means to accept God's love. My dad every year is like the pro at frustrating all of us because, you know, we do this gift exchange thing and we all, you know, we have all the gifts in front of us and we go around the room and my dad always goes, skip me, skip me. And we get done and everyone's opened their gifts and my dad hasn't opened any gifts. Now we bought certain gifts for him. We're excited to give the gift. And yeah, that's one thing to give the gift, but I didn't just give it so it can set in a box in front of you, dad. 
I want you to open it. I want you to receive it. I want to see your face when you really see what I thoughtfully got you or my wife thoughtfully got you. Anyway, but you know, that, that idea, I, I'm excited about that. And the same thing. God's love is a wonderful thing. And yes, sometimes we look at it in these little cute scenes that we have around Christmas time, but to not take it and receive it and accept it, well, we're missing the whole point of the thing. So a huge challenge is to accept the love that comes at Christmas. But lastly, the Christmas challenge is not just recognize it, not just accept it, but then reflect it. And I'm not saying reflect upon it, I'm not saying ponder about it, I'm saying reflect it like a mirror. That part of our, our responsibility is to take this love of Christmas and let it shine through us. Let us be that girl on the college campus that somebody else goes, I don't know what is going on there, but I need to know more. Because we're reflecting the love. Uh, John 13, 34 says, so now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another. For love comes from God, and anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And that's not saying, so if you're not good enough, you, you know, you're not getting that love. That's saying, if you truly are accepting and receiving, if you really have accepted God's love, you won't be able to help but reflect that love. Because if we do find ourselves, if we are pressing into God, if we personally are pressing into the things, the reality of the Christmas story, well then it is just going to shine out through us. Because that God that we are pressing into is the God of love. And so regardless of how we got there, Regardless of whether we are, man, in it and we have been for most of our lives or we're still checking this out from a distance, maybe there's been someone in our life that, boy, it, it's been significant and we're just kind of exploring more into this. We've got to recognize amidst all the other stuff, there is a real love of God. We've got to make the decision to accept that for ourselves. And then we've got to be willing to be the one that is passing it on to the next person. That's our job at Christmas. That's the joy of Christmas. And that's what makes Christmas so much more significant than just the commercial side of Christmas. Would you pray with me? Lord, I wanna thank you for the reality of this Christmas story. I wanna thank you for how it, in fact, does change everything for us. Lord, we celebrate you, we celebrate your love. And Father, I pray right now at this moment, if there is anybody sitting here this morning who has seen your love reflected in others, who has heard talks about your love, but has just never been able to actually receive it for themselves, that whatever tricks the enemy has been doing, whatever lies the enemy has been telling about not you, not because of your past, Lord, that you would dispel that and that this Christmas, maybe for the first time, that your love would be able to be accepted. Lord, everything we do is just to proclaim that it is for everyone. We believe it, and we pray that everyone would receive that. We celebrate your love this Christmas. We celebrate that it's for us. We celebrate that it is for everyone, and we will do our part to make it known. We praise you. We celebrate you. We honor and glorify you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Well, it is, uh, it is good stuff. Um, someone challenged me that I say awesome at the end of every time, and I'm trying not to, but I didn't that time. Anyway, um, I hope you continue to enjoy and be blessed by what is happening at Christmas, certainly here at Gitmo, certainly uh, in your families, in your life. We have so much to celebrate, and it's good to do it together. Let's stand together, and let's let the team lead us in uh, one final song of Christmas celebration.